Well, good morning, church. So good to see you here today. What a time we live in. And I want to, um, first of all, start by saying uh, on behalf of the Kentucky Baptist Foundation, thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm the uh, new president. I've been on the job just a few weeks. But to be honest with you, I'm a pastor at heart. I started pastoring when I was 25 years old. I was a single pastor. Can you imagine that in this day and time? But I uh, went out and I've preached for a, a long time across the Commonwealth, uh, most recently in Somerset, where I stayed for 13 years until the Lord called me uh, to my position here in the uh, foundation role. Uh, so thank you for the invitation, but I kind of am going to go into pastor mode right off the bat because, um, first of all, congratulations on calling a new pastor. This is awesome. I know as a colleague, Dr. Woods, he's just awesome. So give yourself a hand. Today I'll be doing a little bit of transition work to try to help prepare you for that day in November when he comes onto the field. But of course, you know him well. He's been here for many weeks supplying and helping the church during the transition. And what an amazing pastor you have called. So we're going to pray for uh, you as well as uh, Dr. Woods in just a few moments. I've also been encouraged by Southern Baptist leaders uh, today, all pastors have, uh, to pray for our country and pray for our president who is in uh, the hospital. And so we want to lift up the president, the first lady, and uh, everyone else. Of course, yesterday in the Commonwealth was a, uh, a day where we saw the most um, people that ever had this COVID-19. So we need to really pray for our state, our nation, and our president. And we just need to pray for our world right now. Um, it is a, just an unbelievable time. But I've got news for you. Greater this is he that's in you than he that is in the world. You have power in the name of Jesus Christ. And we need to continue not to live in fear. Take our precautions. Listen to the guidance. But live with, as we've been singing this morning, the victory that comes in Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what the church should be doing. And so we want to uh, begin my time together with you, praying for Dr. Curtis Woods, praying for the church, and praying for our country. So would you bow your heads and hearts and go to the Lord in prayer with me? Father, what a joy it is to come into the house of the Lord. As the psalmist said, his heart was full when he came to the house of the Lord. And each one of us can say the same thing. We're thankful for this historic church that's been preaching the gospel for years and years. They have faithfully given to the cooperative program. They've been sending missionaries around the world. And in my ministry, I have witnessed the faithful examples of great pastors like Dr. Cobble. We thank you for his amazing leadership. Dr. Billy Compton, Brother Bill Langley, and so many others that have served before them. Thank you for their amazing leadership. And now I ask that you would put your hand of blessing upon our next pastor, Dr. Curtis Woods, thank you for his amazing intellect. Thank you for the way in which you have blessed him spiritually with leadership skills. Thank you for the pastor's search committee for drawing him, uh, his name to them and to this church for uh, confirming this presentation. So Lord, we ask a blessing on the church, on Dr. Woods. We also pray for our country, our state, as we're going through uh, the midst of this pandemic. I pray for researchers that would find vaccines. I pray that you would uh, keep us safe. We do pray for our president and first lady and all those who have been uh, impacted by this virus and those in the hospital right now. We lift them up to you. 
So Lord, we know that the church is essential because we have come together to worship. And now we've just prayed collectively and as, and as individuals for healing on people. So we know that this worship service is imperative for this body of believers. Bless, I pray, this service and all that's said and done. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. For I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you for the uh, warm uh, hospitality that I've already received in the first service. And um, I'm glad that you're here today as well. And those who are watching on our streaming services, uh, thank you for being uh, watching. And I pray whatever time you're watching it, that you'll receive a blessing from God. You know, I've uh, just, re- just kind of finished pastoring and uh, who knows what the Lord's path for me will be in the future, but I'm so blessed to be uh, where I am. But there are four or five things I thought I would share with you as, as we kind of prepare you for transition to Dr. Woods. And then I'm going to share a message from God's Word from the book of James. But I have five things that I learned why I pastored for 13 years in Somerset. And I thought I'd put those up on the board uh, for you. The first thing I learned is that God can turn any situation around for his good. I went into a church that had gone through a terrible season before my arrival. But God did some amazing things. Uh, taking a church that just was hanging on. It, it was birthed in 1799, something like uh, Severns Valley Historic Church, but it had gone down to maybe 250, 300 people. But God did some amazing things. And by the time we left, God had allowed it to grow to well over 1,200, 1,000 to 1,200 people each weekend. And we praise God for that. God can do anything. And God's going to do some amazing things in the future, even here, more than he's even done perhaps in the past. Do you believe that, church, that God is the God of miracles? I do. And secondly, God will bless a church when they follow biblical leadership. You've got a man of God coming. I encourage you to pray for him every single day. I encourage you to lift him up, and to say a few good words to him. I had a past, I had a, a member who every Sunday, whether I preached a good sermon and bad, and I preached a lot of bad ones, I'm sure, but he would say every Sunday, Pastor, you're the greatest. Now, I know I'm not the greatest, but he made me feel like I was. Why don't you become Pastor Curtis's greatest encourager? That'd be awesome. I remember when I was that single pastor, I was telling you about it, I was 25. So I would go to Walmart, you know, how many go to Walmart? We all go to Walmart eventually. So I went to Walmart and I ran in one day and got a few things and uh, I was checking out and uh, the total came to like $22. And I looked in my wallet and I had a $20 bill. (laughs) And I said, I'm sorry, ma'am. I only have $20. I'm going to take something back. I'm just a poor Baptist preacher. And she says, I know. I heard you last Sunday. (laughs) (laughs) But Curtis is going to have some amazing sermons. But on his good sermons and his bad, quote unquote, less than perfect, encourage him. Third thing I learned was this. The church should be at the center of your family. If you're a teenager, how many teenagers do we have? Under 18, raise your hand. Yeah, you're in the right place. Aren't you glad you have a great youth ministry? Yeah, you have a great youth ministry. What about these children around here? Or don't you have a great children's ministry? SV kids, aren't they great? Aren't they awesome? Senior adults, you have a great senior adult ministry. The church should be at the center of everything you do. Now, trust me, I'm an athlete. I've coached. I've done all that. My son plays at UK baseball. I mean, we are sports family. But we are a church family first. 
I think we need to rekindle that enthusiasm for the church to me and to the people in my home. Church is essential. That's the fourth thing I learned was this. You're to keep learning and growing throughout every season of life. Yes, you've gotten your kids raised and you don't have to do quote unquote nursery anymore or you don't have to be a volunteer in this. Let me tell you something. We were sending out people from our church on mission fields at 80 years old and over. Don't ever sit down. Be sure, you may be providentially hindered. You may not be able to do what you used to do, but don't give up. Keep serving, keep growing. If nothing else, and you think this is quote unquote nothing else, find a preacher boy. Find a young lady that's going on the mission, training to be a missionary and write them notes. I'll never forget receiving a note the first week of every month when I was in seminary from a lady whom I didn't know that well, but she was on, I was on her prayer list. I went home one day, my home was in Ashland, and I went to the mall, we were walking, and this lady, still very active in her 80s, said, is that you, French Harmon? She said, come over here. I went over here, and she said this, I'll never forget it. She said, I pray for you every single morning. Church, there's power in prayer. One final thing I learned is pastoring. Life is best spent with family, friends, and on the simple things of life. So you have a new pastor coming. Encourage him is what I'm telling you. But Tom Rainer recently wrote this article that talks about how pastors are leaving ministry at a very alarming rate. And I want you to understand why. He gives six reasons. We'll go through these very quickly and then I'll get on with my message. Number one, pastors are weary from the pandemic just like everyone else. It's tough being a pastor. It's tough being in a glass house all the time. You see them up here, they're cool, they're calm, they're collected. It's not always like that. It's tough. I remember preaching, you know, to 1,500 people on Easter or, or more. This past Easter, I preached to no one but an empty sanctuary. Emotionally, that's tough. Secondly, pastors are greatly discouraged about fighting taking place among church members about post-quarantine church. When none of them was going, there wasn't a whole lot to argue about, but it seems like this has caused so much confusion in the church. Okay, let me tell you, unless in case no one else has, no one likes wearing these, okay? But here's what pastors have to deal with. Some church members say, we're not coming to church until we don't have to wear masks. And then some people say, if you don't enforce that mask mandate, we're not coming to church. It's kind of tough. But here's the deal. Wear your mask as you can and follow God and support your church. It's very tough on the pastor. Thirdly, pastors are discouraged losing members in attendance. That's the great issue. Now, obviously, if you have pre-existing conditions and you are unable to come, we understand that. But many people, let's be honest, they're at Walmart they're at the restaurants, they're everywhere else. But when it comes to church, all of a sudden they said, we can't come, really? Do you think Satan's done a number on their mind? Perhaps. Next. Pastors don't know if their church will be able to support ministries financially in the future. Number five. Criticisms against pastors have increased significantly. Sure. A lot going on in our world, and pastors sometimes are the easy target. And not lastly, the workload for pastors has increased greatly. Dr. Rainer says this is a real issue keeping pastors serving. So you've got a great one coming. I ask you to think about these things and encourage him, pray for him, and build the church 
the way uh, the Lord wants it to be built in his image. So today, the Lord has prompted me to bring this message from God's word, from James chapter 1. And so, in honor of God's word and in honor of Jesus Christ, would you stand for the reading of God's word? I'm going to ask you to read it out loud with me. It'll be on the screens. Begin. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forget what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the law, perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works. This person will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks he's religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. May his name ever be praised. The book of James is a very practical book. It perhaps would be related to the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. It's something you can read and and you can apply almost immediately to your walk with Christ. And so this morning as you're beginning to uh, start this transition with a new pastor. I want to remind you of three very easy things to consider. We'll focus our attention on verse 22. And that verse says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The first thing I want to remind you what this verse says is to be a hearer of the word. Hear the word of God. The scriptures say over and over, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we need to understand we must hear the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is so powerful. Hebrews 4.12 describes the word of God as living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a weapon, as it were. Offensive and defensive. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But for me, I have every, seemingly every Bible app you can get I have devotions on my Bible, on my phone. I have all these amazing technological um, uh, secrets that can be applied to one's life, so to speak. I love having the convenience of technology, but there's something to it. When I show up at church on the Lord's Day and I take my Bible in my hand and I carry it in the front doors of the church, and I prepare to worship. There's something about it. There's something about hearing those, word, those pages turn. It's amazing to me personally. I'm going to challenge each of you to take the word of God for what it is. It is the greatest book of human history written over a 1,500-year period, three different languages, 40 different human writers, but one author, God. And he wrote this as a love letter to mankind. And he wants us to take it seriously. The word here in verse 22 of the book of James chapter 1 is the Greek word 
a cotis, which means to be an active listener. We are to actively listen to the word of God. Let me illustrate it like this. During this season where we were sheltering it in place, I have uh, three children, two come back from college. I have another uh, son in high school. He's getting ready to go to college. And so we're all sheltering in place. And by the way, ladies and perhaps some men, you all are, have done an amazing job cooking. I mean, uh, how many new dishes have you ladies uh, I guess, brought together. How many men have become like grill masters? I haven't put my skills on the line every, every weekend in our patio. I try to do some new grilling things, but I'm telling you, you all have done great. And as it, as it got going in this sheltering in place, we ended up having a lot of garbage. And so I would tell my boys, I said, boys, take the garbage out, take the garbage out. But they didn't always listen, you know? But when I said, Jack, take the garbage out, he started listening actively. Perhaps his allowance was in balance. I don't know. But he started really listening and doing what he was asked to do. And that's kind of the energy that you need to look at his word with. We need to be actively listening to his word. This is an amazing book. It's God's love letter to us, and it's his, uh, his direction. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that God will direct your path if you follow his word? You should, because it's his word wanting to direct you. You see, one of the biggest issues we have in this post-pandemic church going forward is showing that we truly believe what we say we do. When I was completing uh, some schooling, I had a professor. He said, now, gentlemen, at that time there was gentlemen in our class. I said, gentlemen, all of you are ready to go out and get your a doctorate, blah, blah, blah. He says, but I want to challenge you all. I want you to get a piece of paper, name it a number one to 10. And I want you to write down the 10 commandments in order. So I'm going to ask you all to do that in your mind. Can you get out your mental notebook and number one to 10 and just write down the 10 commandments? Well, most of us would have trouble naming them in order. But I think we understand these aren't 10 suggestions. These are the 10 commands of God that he wants us to learn and kind of framed by Martin Luther said that the 10 commandments are like a guidepost that points us to the Lord. They're like a fence that keeps us from going where we ought not go. You should have no other gods before him. You should take the shouldn't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You should not break any graven images before the Lord. You should remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You should honor your father and mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Charles Stanley, the retiring pastor of First Baptist Church of Atlanta, said, that Christians that walk best with God are around people that keep his word. Hear the word of God. But secondly, it says we need to apply the word. It says be doers of the word and not hearers only. We need to hear and make sure you are hearing the word. But secondly, you need to apply the word. The word doer there in the Greek is the word potei, which means to produce. Kind of like a poet 
is writing creatively. That's the same concept the Greek uh, translation has. And for us, as we as Christians, we need to be doers. We need to be producers. We need to be active in the advancement of the kingdom. Now I realize that sometimes we need to stand there and let the word of God shower over us and to teach us and to build us up and to, in some cases, tear us down. We need the word of God to do what it does. But once we have heard the word, we need to become doers of the word. What does it mean to be a doer of the word? It needs to be a producer. It needs to be an advancer of the kingdom. How do you do that? I think everyone in here would say, I want to expand. I want to advance the kingdom of God. Some of us need to remind, be reminded of our life before Jesus Christ. Just by a show of hands, how many were saved and baptized before the age of 18? Raise your hand. See how many of that is? That's awesome. You can put your hand down. And what this should be a reminder of, church, of how important the youth and children's program of your church is. If you haven't encouraged your children's pastors and your youth leaders recently, why don't you do that? They do an amazing job. Amen? Give them a hand right now. Because they are bringing the word of God to them and oftentimes these, these young hearts soak up the word and respond. But some of us didn't become Christians until we were adults. And some of the things that we did in our adult life prior to meeting Christ isn't something we would ever want to repeat. And so when we think about applying the word, when we think about doing the word, many of us need to be working for the Lord out of a thankful heart. Thank God he forgives us. Amen. God is a forgiving God. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. The difference between Jesus and us, he lived our, this life perfectly. We are sinners. But Jesus went all the way to Calvary's cross, as it were, sinlessly living. Based on some trumped up charges, he was put on an old rugged cross. They put nails in his hands and his feet. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They thrust a spear in his side. They spit on his, spat on his face. They cursed him, laughed at him, gambled for his clothing, on and on and on. And what did Jesus do? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus, the ultimate example of love, died. And on that Friday when Jesus died, no doubt Satan roared with approval. The demons next to him were absolutely thrilled. They thought that God had lost, that Jesus was dead and would never rise again. But that was Friday. And Sunday was coming, and Sunday did come. And Jesus rose victoriously from the grave, walked out. Forty days later, he ascended back to God the Father. And let me tell you something, church. One day, he's coming back. That's what we need to be understanding. We serve a God who owns it all and is willing for us to be partners with him. Imagine that. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in this world. I love John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe you serve a God who loves you and has given you the promise of everlasting life? Raise your hand. Praise God. You see... Hear the word, but apply the word. 
What does that mean to apply the word? Well, it should come out of a heart of thankfulness, but also should be prompting you to do something. This morning on my way to your church, I traveled by Hodgenville. Anyone from Hodgenville, by the way? Yeah. I love it. When a kid was a kid, I remember going to the Abraham Lincoln uh, birthplace. I love this story about Abraham Lincoln. It was in the midst of the Civil War. All of us Kentuckians are proud of Abraham Lincoln. In the midst of the Civil War, there was a famous preacher from New York coming to preach in Washington, and the aides to the president said, President Lincoln, would you like to go and hear this preacher from New York who's coming to Washington this Sunday? And the president said, you know, I think I would. And so they arranged it for the president to go to the church and he would come in about midway through the service and leave before the service was over, not to be kind of intermingling with the crowd and all that. Come to think about it, he'd be a pretty good Southern Baptist. Uh, uh, you'll get that joke later. But anyway, so the preacher preached, and his oratory skills were amazing. He had the people mesmerized, and after the service, the aides uh, bringing the president back to the White House said, well, what did you think, Mr. President, of the preacher this morning? And to their surprise, he said, I didn't think much of him, of the message, I should say. And they said, why? He was really a great preacher. The president said, he was a great preacher. But the one thing I didn't hear from him was, he didn't ask me to do anything. He says, I'm asking the citizens of the United States to sacrifice. I want a preacher to challenge me to be a better soldier of the cross. Well, I don't want you to leave here today. And you say, oh, I heard a message about the word of God. Yes, you're supposed to hear a message, but you're supposed to apply the message. And that's the important word today. Apply, be a doer of the word. What does that mean? That means some of us who've been called to the ministry needs to, need to get going and preach and teach and go on those mission trips and spread the word of God to every person we meet. But that's not just for preacher types. It's for all of us. Maybe you need to begin to volunteer in that children's program or that youth program. or Maybe you need to be involved in the church in some way or in the community. You need to apply the word of God. And most of you don't know me. I'm sure most of you don't. But 22 years ago, I looked a lot differently. I had no hair. I was in the midst of a serious battle with cancer. The doctors did not give me a good chance of making it. But I had some amazing doctors. And importantly, I had some amazing prayer warriors. Now, church, do you really believe in the power of prayer? Do you really believe that God can still perform miracles? Because if you don't, you're looking at one. I was in northern Kentucky at the time. And I had several airplane pilots in my church. I'll never forget this. The church was praying. We'd done all that we could do. It was in the hands of God the doctors, medicine. But this pilot asked me, he said, when are you taking your next treatment? I was taking heavy doses of chemotherapy, heavy doses of radiation. And at that time, they didn't have any good nausea medicine, so I don't need to go any further. This pilot who had Mondays off 
said, I'm just going to show up at your appointment. I said, oh, you don't need to go. It, it takes four or five hours. You don't need to, to come to me. I'll be fine. He says, Pastor, the Lord's told me to do this. So when I arrived at my normal treatment center, this pilot who flew Delta pilots international, Delta planes internationally, stood, uh, sat in the back, and for five hours prayed. Five hours. When I got through with the treatment, I said, "Surely the goodness, this man's still not here." When I walked out of the treatment, he was still there. I said, please don't do this again. I said, I, I know you, you're praying for me. You can pray at home. He says, I need to be here. And every time I took a treatment, unless he was on the plane, he was there. That's doing the word. Do you understand what I'm talking about? It's one thing to hear the word on Sunday morning and go out and it doesn't affect you. It's another thing to do the word, which brings me to my third point and final point. Watch God work. God is an amazing God. It says in verse 24 that you'll be blessed in all you do. The word blessed there is mekeros, which simply means to be happy, to be blessed in spirit. Christians, we serve a mighty God, a God who can and will perform not just miracles, but help direct your path into the ways you ought to go. It's amazing to me to watch God work in our lives. In just a few moments, we're going to see a miracle. Truly. Pastor Andy's going to baptize his daughter. I remember baptizing my three children. That is such a special moment. I want you to soak it all in because this will be a very important moment. But I don't think we understand how amazing salvation is to begin with. This word talks about how to be happy in Christ. How to be happy following God. Psalm number one says, don't walk with the wicked, don't stand with the sinners, and don't sit with mockers, but rather meditate on his word and you'll be like a, a tree planted by the rivers of water that will, in essence, bear fruit in his season. God has a season for every one of us. Some of us are in the planting stage. Some of us are in the reaping stage. Some of us are in a difficult season. God knows. And here's the thing. God cares. In fact, he says in his word, cast all your care upon me, for I careth for you. God cares. Now, here's the thing I want to remind you with. Hear the word, do the word, but watch God work. What God's going to do through Dr. Curtis Woods, through this church, will be amazing if you listen to him. Curtis can't do it all. No pastor can, but going alongside, making it together, you all can do more. I want to remind you how important it is to trust in God in the little things of life. You know, and most of you remember revivals in the old days. It hadn't been that old that long ago, but revivals used to be very commonplace in the Commonwealth. I personally have preached several revivals. I'll never forget preaching in this small eastern Kentucky town. I was probably 30 at the time. And in um, this church, the way it was constructed, there were windows on the side. It started on a Sunday night, and I remember as I was preaching, I, I saw this young man 
kind of out of the corner of my eye with this, these open windows, I watched him as he walked by. And he just caught my attention. Didn't think a whole lot of it until the next night. At about the same time, this young man walked by. But this time, he stopped and listened for a couple of minutes. I thought, that's strange. Third night, same thing, although he came to the front door but didn't come in. The last night of the revival, the man walked by, walked over to the front door, set in as I began my message. I preached the best gospel message sermon I could as I began to give the invitation. There was a movement of God. People were coming forward. It was amazing. But this young man, the first time he ever heard the message that I delivered, walked down and gave his heart to Christ. It was amazing. The people knew the young man and they all rejoiced because this person was literally walking on the wrong side of the tracks. But God changed his life. And here's the good news. That young man not only came into the church, but later surrendered to the ministry and is now a full-time pastor at a church over in the mountains. And I say, God can do anything. Watch God work in your life. If you'll listen, if you'll do what it says, He can do some amazing things. I'm proof. And some of you are too. Not just physically, but how God has used our witness in our walk. So today, church, as you prepare for this new pastor, be blessed. Listen to the word. Do the word. And watch God at work. Would you bow your head with me?